this box to stand on. Well, I know you've had a long day. I don't have a long speech. You know, sometimes senators filibuster and talk on and on. I promise you, I, I think it's about 15 minutes, but I'm going to make it 12. Uh, Joe, what a person you are, you and Sarah. Uh, we love you so much, Stu and I, and Stu's here tonight. And I'm just thrilled. Well, thank you. He deserves a little applause. We're, we're married so long, 52 or three? 52 years, yeah. And, um, and, I, and people say, you know, was it difficult? They said, well, I had to be pretty difficult, and uh, you could figure out our age. I said it was like Stu married Debbie Reynolds, and he woke up with gold in my ear. It was a very <laughs> unexpected <laughs> turn of events. Um, well, when I was getting ready to, to come here, and I, I know how hard you all are working on this, I, I, I checked on a saying that I learned when I was a kid, part of Jewish folklore, and it, it reads this way, whoever saves a life, it is as if that person has saved the whole world. Think about it. And that's what you are all about, saving lives. And I am so honored to join you in this fight. And this extraordinary summit would not be possible without our hosts. And I want to thank the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, the Joint Commission Center for Transforming Healthcare, and of course, our wonderful friend, our wonderful friend, Joe Kiani. It was Joe who truly opened my eyes. He talked about that, about how he told me about this. He opened my eyes to this tragedy of medical errors in America. And I know a lot of you are here because of Joe's passion and his persistence. He's not one of these people who uh, sees a problem and hopes someone else will solve it. He rolls up his sleeves, he gets to work, and then he convinces others to do the same, and he convinces, and he convinces, and he convinces with his compassion and his passion and the facts. So looking around this room and having shaken a few hands of some very special friends that I have, I really am overwhelmed with the quality of the people in this room, so many doctors, nurses, patients, patient advocates, medical tech pioneers, public health experts, government officials, all here for the same reason, to demand and insist that needless medical errors become a thing of the past. Um, recently, I was sitting in the audience and some wonderful speaker used another expression that I thought I'd share with you, which is, a bird flies faster in formation than when it flies alone. And I thought, that's a great saying. I wonder if it's true. And I looked it up, and it's true. Geese fly 71% further together than they do alone. So it's true of human beings. Of course, I face that in the Senate every day. <laughs> they're flying here, they're flying there, and we don't get anywhere. So if we intend to succeed on this issue, which involves so many people, so many institutions, so many procedures, so many steps, we have to work together. And if we're going to reach the summit's goal of zero preventable deaths, we have to fly together. Now here's the thing about this. Once you know about it, failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. Once when I was a county supervisor, somebody came and told me, I was, that was in Marin County, California, a million years ago. And they said, you know, this is a Frank Lloyd Wright building and it's on an earthquake fault, but let's not tell anybody. That's what they said. What do you mean, let's not tell anybody? I'm married to an attorney. Once you know about this, you're liable. I hate to say it, we're not liable in the legal sense. We're liable in the moral sense. Don't you believe that? Now, in trying to put a little humor into this topic, which is very serious, I thought about my Jewish mother, who taught me early on about prevention. Her favorite saying was, honey, without your health, you got nothing. How many of you had mothers who told you similar things? Anybody? Yes, you did. Doesn't matter the ethnicity. 
And so she'd say it over and over again. It was really annoying at a point. You know, without your health, you have nothing. But now, looking back on it, I think she said it for two reasons. One, she always wanted me to bring a sweater with me. <laughs> it didn't matter what the weather was, button up the sweater. But Ma, it's hot outside. She'd say, I'm cold, button up the sweater. So that was one reason. But the other was more really philosophical, not that she realized it, but you know, there's a lot of talk today about income inequality. And I grew up, let me tell you, quite lower middle class. We lived in a very small apartment and had everything, but we didn't really have that much. So my mother would always say, when some very famous, beautiful, gorgeous, wealthy actress got really sick, my mother would say, you see, she's got the beauty, she's got the wealth, she's got everything, she doesn't have her health. And without your health, you have nothing. So that was the way she dealt with income inequality and the lack of fairness in the world. But my mother was right in a serious way. Health is everything. And so when I first heard from Joe about the mission of zero preventable deaths, and after he left and I really got to think about it, I said to my staff, let's find out the leading causes of death in America. They said, well, we looked it up. It was different lists and different things and we couldn't find it. And so we finally found out, and I'll tell you how we found out, but uh, you know number one is heart disease, more than 590,000 a year, secondly, cancer, more than 575,000. And if you ask some of your smartest friends, they'll get those two, but they don't get the third one, medical errors. Between 210,000 and 440,000, there's nothing close to that. So that's the really terrible news that we're dealing with and what we're working on. The good news is that we actually have a new law for the first time that will help us address all three of these epidemics heart, cancer, and medical errors. You might have heard of this law. It's called Obamacare. And I do, yes, you should applaud Obamacare. I want to thank Chairman Tom Harkin, who you're honoring tomorrow night, for his incredible leadership in that life-saving new law. But how is Obamacare helping prevent deaths from heart disease and cancer? Well, we remember what it was like before. Remember when insurance companies could deny you care because you were sick or charge you more because you were a woman? You know, they even charged women who were the victims of domestic violence. They said domestic violence was a pre-existing condition. Oh yeah, and, and a lot of times they either charged them very much or didn't insure them. Now remember when people without insurance never got the chance to go to the doctor and catch heart disease or cancer and so they could treat it and beat it. According to Families USA, talk about preventable deaths, more than 26,000 Americans died in 2010, just in 2010, because they didn't have health insurance. Now because of Obamacare, millions of Americans have quality affordable care. By the way, there's nine million Americans now benefiting with new secure coverage because of Obamacare, and that's going up exponentially. This is the old numbers. That's three million adults who can now stay on their parents' policies. That's 2.1 million people who have signed up for private coverage through the new exchanges, and 3.9 million who have coverage through Medicaid and the CHIP program. So this law is changing people's lives. I'm just gonna give you one example. Seven-year-old Liam McAllister was born with an autoimmune disorder. Before the law passed, Leah's mother applied to eight different companies for insurance, but none offered care they could afford. Now the family has coverage through Obamacare. Leah's able to get a procedure done that fixed a spinal cord problem that would have resulted in paralysis. So this is what Leah's mother said, quote, without Obamacare, my family would be bankrupt and Leah wouldn't have gotten the health care she needs. There's one last one I have to talk to you about. Janine Reed from San Francisco Bay Area, whose son Mason has brain cancer. Without Obamacare, Mason would have hit his lifetime limit on coverage and the family would have been driven into bankruptcy. His mom, Janine, wrote that the family, quote, quote, thanks God 
and whoever else will listen for our good fortune to have coverage. So that's what we're doing to get people insurance so that they can catch these conditions early and if they have one, get it taken care of. But many people don't know Obamacare is also taking big steps to address the third leading cause of death, the subject we're here to talk about, medical errors. And I know a lot of you in this room helped get that done. And I will never forget when Joe introduced me to Lenora Alexander, who told me her family's tragic story. 10 years ago, her daughter Leah, a healthy 11-year-old, underwent elective surgery to repair a chest deformity. After the operation, Leah's doctors told her mother that the surgery had gone very well and the epidural anesthesia used during the procedure had been left in place to manage her pain during her recovery. But two nights later, two nights later, Leah died due to undetected respiratory arrest caused by the very drugs that were intended to ease her pain. The patient was not being monitored closely enough. Look. I'm a U.S. Senator for a long time, and for those of you who helped me get here to work on these issues, I am ever so grateful. I am also a mother, I am a wife, as I told you, I'm a grandmother. I understand the pain Leah's mother has to live with every day, knowing that her daughter could still be alive if someone or something had caught the problem before it was too late. Her story absolutely broke my heart. And it's tragedies like these that you are trying to prevent and Obamacare is trying to uh, prevent every day. I, I don't know if Leah's sister is here. Are you here today? I heard that you were coming. I don't know if you're here. But I just want everyone to know that these stories, you can't turn away from these stories. The law, Obamacare, created the public-private partnership for patients. It's dedicating $1 billion to preventing hospital-acquired conditions. More than 3,700 of the 5,800 hospitals in America are participating. Now, I do have some news. I don't have exact numbers, but we know in the spring there'll be an official announcement. But I do know from conversations with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality that the partnership is already saving money and saving lives, and that is great news. And so when the spring comes, we'll know more detail. And Joe, I think it'll be a milestone in this battle that we're all in. Uh, the Affordable Care Act will also start paying hospitals based on how well they address medical errors. Hospitals that fail to address it will see their Medicare reimbursements cut by 1%. May not seem like a lot, but we know Medicare is not reimbursing at the rate it should anyway. So a 1% cut will be uh, felt. Now, these are important steps, but more needs to be done. So after the meeting uh, with Lenore Alexander in my office last spring, I asked my staff for a plan to address the most devastating preventable errors. And I said, again, bring me the list. Well, again, we found out there were lots of lists. So I wrote to two federal agencies with the most influence, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, and it took two months, but we got an answer. So there is a list. There is finally a list. And uh, I'm gonna share that list with you. I don't know if you've seen it, but I'll run through it very quickly. Uh, the nine most common and harmful medical errors. In other words, the ones that are causing the most problems. Adverse drug events, catheter-associated urinary tract infections, central line-associated bloodstream infections, injuries from falls and immobility, obstetrical adverse events, pressure ulcers, bed sores, surgical site infections, venous thrombosis, blood clots, ventilator-associated pneumonia. Now, you are all the professionals. I'm like looking at this and thinking, without a degree, these are preventable. And uh, I'll give you a couple of cases. I know you're working on this all day. Um, Medi medication errors. Chris Wabito, a 21-year-old from San Jose, died in 05 when the hospital he, where he was receiving chemo for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma mistakenly injected his spine with medication meant for another patient. The same year, Josephine Francis Hart, a 12-year-old girl who loved to sing and play with marbles, was admitted to the ICU at a hospital in Santa Clara to be treated for pneumonia. 
She died after a nurse accidentally administered a double dose of epinephrine, mistaking one of the bags for an antibiotic. According to the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, certain types of interventions, like simple things requiring two people to independently verify medications before they're given to a patient, can detect 95%, 95% of these errors before they occur. And then there's these infections. Uh, more than a third could be uh, prevented simply by applying routine hand washing for anyone who comes into contact with patients. And falls, we know frail patients fall. The right staffing, the right procedures can prevent these falls, which can be life-threatening. So as I conclude my remarks to you, um, you know we're learning more every day about how to prevent these medical errors. We have to ensure that the federal government gets the finalized list of preventable errors to the hospitals quickly. I am so revved up about this, I will hand deliver that list to any hospital. You ask me, I'll be there with the list. And in return, we have to have the hospitals respond immediately with the steps they are taking to decrease these errors. This is not rocket science. This is will. Where there's a will, there's a way. And there has to be a way, and it has to be done. We need to, and we need to protect practitioners, some of you are in this room, doctors, nurses, and other medical staff from being retaliated against for reporting medical errors. We have to all rise to the occasion and call it out when we see it. We need unvarnished first-hand accounts from the front lines every day. So in conclusion, if you or I were on the street corner and we saw uh, someone about to step off the curb and get hit by a bus, we'd pull that person back from disaster. Well, because of you in this room and the special person named Joe Kiani who's leading so many of you and all of us working together, we have the opportunity to do that, to pull more than 200,000 people back from the brink of disaster every single year by preventing medical errors. Now, in my work, I've got a 1,000 issues. Many of them, seriously, <laughs> we can never get an agreement on. It's so difficult. And I won't go through the list because you'll get depressed. We're already working on something hard right here. But we know something about this issue. This we can do. This we can fix if we do it together. We can avert the worst kinds of needless tragedies. So that life that I talked about from that old saying that when you save a life, you really, in a way, you save the world. You can save that life over and over again. And so few people living in the world today have the opportunity that you have, that we have, to do so much good by using our common sense, our determination, cooperation. That's what it will take. And I am so pleased that I've been invited to fight this fight with you. Thank you so very much, and have a wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you.